with another fat bear week in the books in one of the United States largest national parks filled with fat successful bears it's time to celebrate the summer that was and look toward the future of Katmai National Park and Preserve and welcome to the party everyone my name is Mike Fitz I'm the resident naturalist with explore.org and a member of the board of directors for the Katmai Conservancy Hi, and I'm Naomi Boak, and I have been a bear cam watcher and addict since 2014. And I was also a media ranger at Katmai for three years. And Mike and I know well the many reasons there are to support the park and the Katmai Conservancy. And now it's the Otis Fund, which is the best time of year to contribute. Mike? Right, we're in the middle of the Katmai Conservancy's annual fundraising campaign. So through the through the Otis Fund, you can support the Conservancy's efforts to provide education and interpretation for the <clears> park, <throat> research on Katmai's brown bears and extensive human history, uh, things like youth engagement in the local communities and online, and help protect the ecological stability of the park. Explore.org has generously agreed to match all donations to the Otis Fund this week up to $200,000 before midnight on October 15. And if my calendar is correct, today is October 15. So you want to get those contributions in today. In the past week, you've already donated up to uh, or actually about $150,000. So thanks to everybody for their generosity. You can find links to donate in the featured comment below the live camera feed on this page or go to catmyconservancy.org. Uh, and if you want to learn more about the Conservancy, of course, there's a, a bunch of information on that website. However, Guy Runko uh, and Michael Bay, who work for the Conservancy, are in the chats answering questions about the organization and to say hello. So um, look for them uh, during the broadcast uh, today. And um, we all know that Katmai is a place like no other, and um, each season seems like it's a season like no other. So I'm sure many of you have a favorite moment or two, and Mike and I will be going through some of our favorite moments from the 2022 season. But if you want to uh, join in and leave us some of your favorite moments, you can write them in the comments, and we hope we'll get to some of them. But um, before we can um, really talk about the bear season um, and Katmai, we really need to talk about the land and the resource and the people who have protected that land and resource for many thousands of years. Mike? Yeah, let's begin with uh, an important message from Katmai Conservancy Board member Andrea Agley about Katmai's landscape and the indigenous peoples who call the area home. Hi everyone, my name is Andrea Agley and I am a board member for the Katmai Conservancy. I am Sukhbiak with family ties to the old village of Sevanoski within Katmai National Park. I grew up in Ganuyang, the Yupik name for the town of South Naknik, which is a small fishing village on the Naknik River. I currently live in Anchorage, Alaska, which is home to the ancestral lands of the Dena Inna Athabascan people. And much like the bears that return every summer to feed on the fish in Brooks River, so did my ancestors, and they did that for thousands of years. And so I want to acknowledge their stewardship on the land and the resources that is now Katmai National Park. I also want to honor the culture and the history and the traditional knowledge that is very much alive and well today. I also want to thank Guy at the Katmai Conservancy for recognizing the importance of land acknowledgement. It's a way to honor the original people of the land and having members understand who took care of and occupied this land before colonization is important, especially as the Katmai Conservancy strives to protect and preserve all that is Katmai National Park. So Guyana, thank you for allowing me to acknowledge the lands of the Sukhbak people. And I wanna thank each and every one of you for celebrating Fat Bear Week with us. Guyana. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, Katmai National Park is a big and complex place. It's 
off the road system, as they say, so you can't get by, there by car. And that's just one minor challenge that um, someone who is running the park faces. Um, and it, it is a complex thing to run. And no one knows the scope of that better than Mark Stern, who is the superintendent of Cap 9 National Park and Preserve. And um, a few days ago, he recorded a message for us all. Hi, everyone. My name is Mark Sturm. Uh, I have the privilege of being the current superintendent at Katmai National Park and Preserve. I'd like to start my comments today uh, by thanking Andrea Agley for, uh, for, her, for her land acknowledgement uh, of the Aleutic Supiak people here at Katmai. Um, I just want to say thank you all for your interest in Fat Bear Week and for returning again for yet another competition. Who can believe another year has come and gone, and it's time for another uh, Fat Bear Week event uh, once again. You know, this event happens annually for us. It's a big event at this point in time. It wouldn't happen without uh, so many great partners that we have uh, with the Explore.org folks and our friends at Katmai Conservancy. Katmai Conservancy is uh, the, the park's philanthropic uh, organization. They help us uh, raise awareness about the park and also help us raise some funds. Uh, the fundraiser that they hold uh, this time of year is really an important uh, event for the park. It helps us fund a whole slew of different types of projects uh, and uh, really is making a meaningful contribution to our ability to, uh, to, to both uh, conduct important work at the park and also engage with uh, surrounding affiliated communities. Uh, types of projects that the funds have helped us, uh, helped us uh, support to date include, um, you know, things as, as benign as just the, the, the ongoing management of, of the park and, and the interaction of visitors and bears. Some of the funds that we use are directed in that direction. Uh, there's also important research that the funds have helped support uh, with regard to, uh, to, to wildlife beyond bears, uh, wildlife uh, uh, questions and research uh, investigations uh, in coastal areas of the park. Uh, the uh, the, the, the Conservancy is also helping us uh, support initiatives to uh, reconnect uh, na native Alaska youth uh, to their ancestral homelands uh, by, by supporting things such as a culture camp and, that's, and, and, uh, and helping folks to, to come back and, and, and reconnect with, uh, with lands that their ancestors came from. Um, there's there's a there's a lot of other types of support that they are they're providing. Uh, they're, they're helping us with uh, engagement with the communities, uh, locally, and also with facilities uh, that we uh, that that we have identified as a need, so that we can continue to provide this type of content. So very much we appreciate your interest in supporting Fat Bear, Fat Bear Week. We we look forward to another great competition, and you know I guess uh, let may the best bear win. Have a great day. Thanks for that message, Mark. Uh, he actually joined a recent board meeting for the Conservancy, and he made a point to reiterate how much support of the that the support of the Conservancy means for the park. You know, one example that he cited, and Naomi, I know you want to talk about this maybe more specifically a little bit later on, but I do want to bring it up because it, uh, in 2019 there were delays and errors in the federal hiring process. Uh, and that prevented this um, Katmai National Park from hiring enough rangers for Brooks Camp. But the Conservancy was able to step in that year and hire staff in a short period of time to fill in the gaps. So our national parks, they're, you know, some of our most special and revered landscapes. And, and while the National Park Service manages those park areas on behalf of the public, other organizations can help shepherd our shared goals to care for and learn about these amazing places. And that's what the Katmai Conservancy does for Katmai National Park. And of course, I asked Guy Runko, the executive director for the Katmai Conservancy, a little bit more about those efforts. So Guy, thanks so much for taking the time out of your day to talk about the Katmai Conservancy. Hey, Mike, I'm happy to talk about it uh, any, anytime. Happy to talk about the Conservancy and Fat Bear Week, and thanks for having me. Let's start at the beginning and some of the basics, uh, especially for people who maybe aren't familiar with the Conservancy. What's the Conservancy's mission? Yeah, the Conservancy is the official nonprofit partner of Katmai National Park and Preserve. We support the preservation of the park, its unique ecosystem, scenic character, and associated natural and cultural resources. And we do this by promoting greater public interest, appreciation, and support through education, interpretation, and research. 
So you mentioned, you know, in a nutshell that the Conservancy works to support Katmai National Park, but I know a lot of people are interested specifically, you know, what that looks like from your end of things. Right, good question. So um, every year, uh, the Katmai Conservancy sits down at the table with Katmai National Park and Preserve and comes up with an annual philanthropic work plan. This is a plan that kind of measures the needs of the park versus the wants of Katmai Conservancy's donors. And then we meet somewhere in the middle, figuring out how we're gonna support the park for the coming year. And what, does, uh, that, what did that look like for 2022? Uh, you know, there are many things uh, that could potentially be funded, uh, but what happened in the past year? Right, so for 2022, uh, a good bulk of our support went towards uh, funding for seasonal park staff. Also, we, uh, we provide funds for tribal partnership projects, for bear and wolf research, educational programs, and community outreach, uh, as well as um, uh, a handful of other initiatives as well. So yeah, plenty of support going to the park from Conservancy this year. And the Conservancy is a young organization. It's not even 10 years old. So how do you envision the organization evolving in the future? Yeah, good question. So yeah, we are a fairly young organization. We were started in 2016, so we're about six years old now. Um, as uh, Fat, Fat Bear Week becomes more and more popular every year, um, obviously uh, more money is being uh, donated to Katmai Conservancy to support the park. So yeah, I, I can only see our support getting uh, more wide ranging and, and, and con the Conservancy being able to support more projects in the future. So I think there's a lot to look forward to uh, as far as the Conservancy's future goes. And you want, you've mentioned to me that you want to stick with the Conservancy for a long time. So I'm wondering what do you enjoy you know, most about your work? That's, that's a tough question, Mike. I mean, as, as a fan of Katmai National Park and a visitor to the park years and years before I ever took this position, this is kind of a dream job for me just to be able to provide support and funding to the park and all of the different initiatives and projects that, that the park has going on. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I couldn't say what my favorite part is, but uh, every part of it is incredible for me, being able to support a park that I love so much. All right. Well, maybe that's almost like asking somebody who their favorite bear is. A lot of us can't All right, quite that's a tough decide. One. But I do want to ask you about Fat Bear Week this year. It was, you know, maybe the biggest Fat Bear Week ever. How does that, you know, contribute uh, to, uh, you know, the outreach that uh, and and fundraising goals for uh, for the Catman Conservancy? Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, the more people that know about Fat Bear Week, uh, the more people are going to know about Katmai National Park and hopefully are going to grow to love it and support it. So uh, we are definitely seeing uh, plenty of donations coming in this this time of year, um, as much as last year, hopefully more. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's really nice to see this worldwide support uh, as, as Fat Bear Week continues to gain traction worldwide. And how were your predictions this year? Did you predict a, a 747-901 final? If I if I'm completely honest, I did predict 747's win. He is just huge this year, um, and uh, in my mind, definitely the fattest bear there. So I think the fattest bear definitely won this year. Well, Katmai is one of the wildest and most remarkable national parks. Guy, we're glad you're here to help ensure Katmai's future. So thanks so much for uh, taking some time to tell us more about the conservancy. It's my pleasure, Mike. Thanks. And thanks again from, uh, for, for Guy's time uh, in sharing his insights about the Conservancy. I also want to acknowledge uh, a couple of former board members for the Conservancy. Uh, they left the organization recently, but they were there from the beginning, really, and helped to establish it as a successful um, uh, friends group. So those um, people are Ellis Bacon and Carl Chapman. So thanks again for all their hard work and contributions to uh, the organization. And um, Naomi, we're getting some, uh, a lot of people sharing their favorite moments right now. Um, and it's been really fun to, to kind of browse some of those as I've been listening to the interviews. Uh, one person wrote in uh, that their favorites are the diving bears and the new young diving bears, um, listing some of the numbers 203, 205, the 94 um, small uh, subadult female and some other bears. Uh, and then also um, somebody else listed, of course, Bear 164, really uh, making his living under the waterfalls, grabbing fish right in front of 747. And I will also add that he did that in front of 856. So yeah, those are some memorable moments indeed.
They certainly are. And um, I, I'm going to have to um, talk a little bit about what you mentioned before, which is um, I am forever grateful to the Cat Mife Conservancy for coming in at the 11th hour and paying my salary and enabling the park to hire me. Um, I worked my first year as a cat, my conservancy ranger. So um, forever grateful to the conservancy for that. They helped change my life. Um, but um, I really missed being a ranger at the park this year a lot. Um, but I didn't miss the 2022 season because um, like I always used to do, I watched the bear cams. So um, maybe we should do a little recap of 2022. How about a little uh, post-game analysis, Mike? Yeah, and this was this, I, this was hard for me to kind of narrow down. And honestly, there were so many different things that I could talk about that um, that I, I think I probably sold the season short just by the, like choosing two or three things to discuss. Uh, you know, the the one thing that I always like to mention. Um, when I'm thinking about how bears did during the summertime at Brooks River specifically, it's just to, to think about the salmon. Uh, it was the season was memorable in a lot of ways, but I think we should start with the <coughs> fish because the survival of Brooks River's ecosystem, as we know it, and the health of the bear population <coughs> is dependent on them. Uh, this year provided another exceptional salmon run, especially for the larger Bristol Bay area. About 72 million sockeye salmon returned to this this region and that's a place that encompasses most of Katmai National Park and many millions of acres to the west and north. It was the largest salmon run on record for the region. Uh, honing in on Brooks River though, uh, about 1.9 million fish returned to the Naknek River watershed which Brooks River is a part of and although we don't know how many sockeye entered Brooks River it's probably in the range of a few hundred thousand fish and these fish are incredible athletes. Uh, they hatch in gravel nests, they spend one to two years in fresh water, they migrate then to the ocean where they'll spend the next two to three years growing big, avoiding predators, and if they survive that journey, then they return to fresh water to spawn. And their return to fresh water is an all or nothing effort. They either spawn or they die trying. So for them, it, there's no return to the ocean. It's, and it, it's an extreme commitment to their life's goal. And finally, salmon enrich the places that they inhabit. You know, th uh, thousands of people all, from all over the world travel to the Katmai region to watch brown bears fishing for salmon or people, many people travel there specifically to fish for trophy-sized rainbow trout and Arctic char. And those are fish that get fat on salmon fry and salmon eggs. And the food and nutrients that salmon bring to freshwater uh, ecosystems, they feed everything from microorganisms to plants, to hungry bears, to wolves to people. Salmon allowed people to occupy the Brooks River area nearly continuously for the last 5,000 years. And today they uh, support a sustainable billion dollar salmon fishing industry. So it's those fish that underpin the whole system. Um, and for bears and people at Bristol Bay, there's really no more important organism. Of course, as I reflect upon the salmon, I, you know, I'm also thinking about you know the stories of the bears. And, uh, and Naomi, I know you wanted to talk about one bear in particular, this year who's maybe changed um his habits since we first uh, saw him on bear cam many many years ago i do but i want to make one more point about the salmon which is um we are also lucky enough to have that underwater cam and um the salmon are not shy about being in front of that camera and we got to see so many salmon this year and um i think it was yesterday i saw um salmon um below the falls and it looked like they were, um, there, there was a red, um, you know, it, uh, protecting her, her nest. So very exciting. But yes, back to the bear I want to talk about who's changed a lot. So um, a few years ago, um, someone asked me if I could be a bear, what bear would I be? And I said, 151 Walker. Um, he's a handsome dude. Um, he's big, but not too big. He, um, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't vie with the big dominant bears. Um, he, he gets big in the riffles. He e eats in the riffles and, and manages to get pretty fat there and not having competition from big bears. And then when it's a little safer to go to the lip, then 151 would go 
to the lip. And he got to be romantic with 708. Amelia, one of the most beautiful bears at Katmai. Uh, I mean, who could ask for more? But in the last year or two, oh my God, 151 has changed completely. I no longer want to be 151. He wants to move up in the hierarchy. He wants more access to females. He wants better fishing spots. He's no longer content to just sit by Otis and um, learn from him. He's competing with him now. Um, and 151 has the scars and the size to show it. He's humongous. And um, I guess when you become a humongous adult male bear, um, your tube changes. So, um, you know, he's a great bear, but personally, I no longer want to be 151. But Mike, you had a couple of families that we had fun watching this season and you want to talk about them. Right. Yeah. Bear families are always a frequent topic of conversation on the bear cams. And, and for much of the summer, we watched uh, one to eight grazer care for her three giant three-year-old or excuse me, her two giant three-year-old cubs. And many of us also uh, closely watched 94 and her four spring cubs. Uh, both of these moms tell, you know, slightly different stories, of course, but it's also stories of challenges and success and hardship. Uh, let's, you know, maybe begin with Grazer and Cubs. This family surprised me by sticking together this summer. Uh, Grazer separated from her previous litter at the beginning of those cubs' third summer. And it's rare for Mother Bears of Brooks River to switch the length of maternal care. So I thought we'd see Grazer as a single bear again this year. She didn't separate from her cubs, though. And this family was a powerhouse when Grazer didn't display, you know, she, she didn't really display as much defensiveness as she's done in the past. Uh, and I think that's probably because she recognized that her cubs were big and they weren't as vulnerable um, as they were the previous two summers. Uh, Grazer's protectiveness and skill though has really set her cubs up for success as they transition into independent bears next spring. So we can really expect, I think, this family to go their separate ways um, next May or June. And then Bear 94, uh, with her four spring cubs at the beginning of the year, that family enthralled us with really the, the relatively rare opportunity to see a mother bear work to protect and nurture a litter of four cubs. This is an especially difficult challenge. No mother bear at Brooks River has ever successfully weaned a litter of four cubs. 94, she showed her adaptability and understanding of her cubs' vulnerability by avoiding the falls area. She used the river mouth most often, uh, and that's a spot where bears are more dispersed and the family would be less likely to encounter, you know, dan dan dangerous situations. Uh, the strategy was successful for most of the summer. The cubs grew, they frolicked, uh, they enjoyed many meals of salmon and milk. In September, however, one of the cubs was killed by another bear. But the surviving cubs in this litter remind us that the lives of the young bears are, are filled really with risk. And even the most experienced and skilled mother bears, bears like number 94 can experience loss. But that should not take away from our admiration for 94 and her efforts uh, this year. And uh, a lot of people, again, sharing their favorite um, you know, memories for the summer. Of course, you know, some comments about Otis rolling in uh, somebody wrote in to say, best moment for me, Otis returning early and looking great. And another person saying, hey, my favorite moment was just yesterday on the River Watch cam when I saw 480 Otis actually running after salmon in the water. It made my heart so happy to see him doing well. He is huge. And yes, he is. Otis looking really good at the end of the season. Uh, so we get to witness the triumphs and tragedies of, of Bear Mother on the Bear Cams. Uh, and, you know, we get to see the, the triumphs of bears like 480 Otis. And Katmai National Park protects habitat for brown bear populations that are, are among the densest in the world. So your contributions to the Katmai Conservancy helps fund things like ranger salaries and initiatives that allow bears to be wild. And protecting like places like Katmai really gives bears the best chance of success. Of course, Naomi, those aren't the only bear stories worth, worth reflecting upon. Um, and I know you have a, a special guest lined up to chat more about that. I do. I'm very excited about this special guest. Um, it's Charlie Annenberg. <laughs> Welcome, Charlie. Oh, Charlie, are you muted? Oh, hold on. 
Ah, okay. Am I on? <laughs> yeah, you are. Okay. You are. So I'm very anxious to hear your thoughts about um, this year, Charlie. Oops. Charlie's frozen in time. Let's see if we can, I can connect with our team and see if something interesting is going on. Because I've been looking forward to talking to Charlie for a long time. Ah, uh, okay. So let's see. Charlie's call dropped and we're just gonna wait for him to come back. I mean, I could go on forever about Fat Bear Week. I must say I did well in the bracket this year. Um, you guys know who I was rooting for. Um, well, if, but, we, if um, we want to, we can, um, we can talk about, I know one of the things, Naomi, that you wanted to talk about with Charlie, and that is the story of 909 to 910. And I'm very interested to get, you know, Charlie's thoughts on that, um, that situation, uh, because that's been a favorite situation, um, you know, a moment for many people throughout the summer. In fact, there's probably like 10 comments in my list here, just specifically about 909 and 910 and their, um, their amazing relationship this summer. Uh, during the, the 10th anniversary of the bear cams this summer, we ended up um, producing several videos where, of moments that I thought were really memorable. And you can find a playlist for that on Explore.org's um, Live Nature Cams YouTube channel. Uh, but uh, this video specifically uh, talks about 909 and 910 and their cubs, because I think this was a really special thing to see. And it was something I never witnessed before. So maybe let's explore this uh, some more. And we'll see if Charlie can join us afterwards. Brown bears have a reputation as loners, which can be well-deserved. Bears don't roam in packs or prides or live in permanent family groups, and they often show little interest in socializing. Yet bears also express a wide range of behaviors and personalities. Some bears can be highly social when circumstances allow. This summer, a remarkable relationship between two bear families highlighted the social side of a normally solitary species, as well as the comfort and joy that bears can find among friends and family. Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska is a special place where dozens of bears gather every summer to fish for salmon. Many, and perhaps most bears using the river were introduced to it by their mothers. As independent bears, they return to feast on a predictable and abundant salmon run. Bears 909 and 910 are siblings who first experienced Brooks River when they were first year cubs in 2016. After they separated from their mom, the sisters initially roamed the river corridor together. But as they matured into early adulthood, they spent more and more time apart, especially during 2021 when Bear 909 returned with her first litter of cubs. Up to this point in their story, everything about their behavior was typical. I expected much of the same this year. At best, I thought they'd express indifference if they came in close contact. That would prove to not be the case. When 909 returned with her now yearling and 910 returned with a single spring cub, the sisters reunited in ways that went beyond simple greetings. Between late July and October, they traveled together. They fished near each other. They allowed their cubs to scavenge food from each other. They play fought and rested as a group. Since Katmai's bears have only about six months to eat a year's worth of food before they enter winter hibernation, they often don't have the luxury of making friends. Competition for food, space, and mating opportunities breeds conflict between these powerful creatures. At Brooks River, however, familiarity combined with access to abundant food promotes tolerance among bears. A bear's keen memory and ability to read body language also allows it to create relationships among individuals. Even so, the behavior of 909 and 910 and their cubs is unique. I had not witnessed anything like it before. In a place where hunger and competition often rule the day, 
these bears found friendship and became an extended family. Welcome back, Charlie. That was something this year. I mean, I called it the Beadnose Dynasty. Um, and um, one of my, actually my favorite thing of this year was seeing 909 and 910 with their melded families. What did you think about seeing those 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 bears together you know watching 909 and 9 in 910 was is incredible and uh just a reminder of to me of how little we know about bears and in their personalities i mean to see them connect the relationships it kind of defied what i had over 10 years had been hearing about bears i mean they operated as one the love the respect the camaraderie it was incredible and what what beautiful bears i mean and from the beginning of the season when i was terrified you know with them up at brooks to how big they became but i you know it's funny i was hearing the interview before with grazer and the cubs and it makes me wonder if there's more of a social hierarchy than we realize or more of a connection between mom and offspring because 909 and 910 I'm not a scientist, but I'd never seen anything like it. And uh, what a joy to see them almost every day. Just it was great. Time. And I I must say, I have my um, 909, 910 <laughs> Explore Springer mug from 2016. Um, but they were always so interesting to watch. Um, they were, they didn't stop playing. They ran beat nose into the ground their first year. Um, when I got there, um, they were they were sub adults, and they played together a lot. And um, much to the consternation of bear management, um, they tried to dig up the sewers by our cabins. And rain, neither Ranger Carl nor Ranger Leslie could stop them. So now there's a big boulder on top of that sewer. Um, so they're always been amazing, but this is more amazing. Than, than anything. And you're right, we're always finding out something more about these bears. Um, Charlie, when you started Explore 10 years ago, I mean, did you, did you have any understanding of what would become of the bear cams and how they would affect people around the world? Well, you know, I, I'd like to first speak selfishly observing the bears for 10 years now and especially this season i find that i fall in love with them more each year because i get to know them more and their personalities or habits and their traits and and i think other people feel the same way and it, it's it's incredibly humbling to see the outpouring of love for these to to me the most sacred place maybe on the planet um and so did I have these expectations? No, but I, I'm actually kind of like almost getting a little into the doldrums knowing season's ending, like I already miss them. And, um, and I think it's because I, I, every day I observe them and they all have so many amazing personalities and they're so different and it's so beautiful. And where else do we get to say nature is working? It's a, it's a real, success story and, and my hands go off to people like yourself naomi and the park rangers and count my conservancy for the selfless work you do you guys almost make it look easy and it's one of the hardest jobs in the world to be up there and uh i think explore has the most beautiful community in the world so anyone watching this right now you know i'm just humbled by all of you that you'd even contribute so much and it's a great great family led by the bears, probably King Otis to the bears, since I know everyone loves Otis. That bear never takes yeah. a vacation. He's still working right now. Incredible. I know. He's out there. And when the snow starts falling, he'll be out there in the snow in his office, I've never, face down. He's, <laughs> that guy never takes a break. He's the hardest working. He's like the, he's the hardest working bear I've ever seen. I'm watching him just last night. Right. Yeah, well, don't let that be an example for the Explore staff because they work really hard already, so they don't have to work 24-7. Uh, I'm, again, blessed to have an amazing team. I'd like to add that. I mean, you know, I'm just, you know, here speaking, but it's really the underpinnings of Explore and the incredible staff we have and the love and devotion 
that are all amazing. And the whole team's amazing, Every, uh, the whole, everything about it. So no, I, I never had these expectations, but I never started with expectations of grandeur. I just wanted to allow people to observe the natural world and fall in love with it because you take care of what you love. And I'm just, you know, I, it's just wonderful. Yeah, no, it's um, personally, I, when at the park, I was grateful every day to be around the bears. And before I got to the park and now after I'm grateful to follow them as well. So how fun was Fat Bear Week this year? Uh, I mean, what is more fun than Fat Bear Week? It was incredible. <laughs> I, I don't know who the super fan is. You try to see if it stuff a ballot with Holly. Um, oh, I think we lost Charlie again. Charlie makes it possible for us to have videos out in the middle of nowhere in Katmai, but we're having trouble with today's connection. Um, Mike, do you have a couple more uh, memorable moments that we can, from our, our viewers? Oh, I just got can, back. Oh. There you go. Oh, you just got back. Okay. I'm so sorry. All right. The Fat Bear Week is, is the March Madness of the na natural. Oops. I've lost Oops. you again. Um, uh, I'm wondering if we want to restart Charlie's connection okay. and we'll come back to him. You go okay? Okay. Yeah, I'm fine. I'll. Am I back? Yeah, you're back. Technology. We're sticking. We're, yeah, technology. And, yeah. and your staff is. At least the bear your staff cams is are shaking. running. <laughs> right. At least the bear cams are running. They don't care about us. It's just the bear cams are running. And that's, I'm sure they're watching the bear cams while we're chatting. So, um, anyway. Um, so, yeah, it was a fun fat bear week. And, um, I'm not sure if that was a bear cam fan or maybe some people in Vegas who wanted a particular bear. The it's the competition has gotten so popular. You know, they're all winners at the end of the day, but it's it's so much fun. And it's just a testament again to the cams and to the park rangers and, and to my and to the staff. I mean, people all over the world are talking about Fat Bear Week. It, it, I have no idea why or how, but uh, I agree. There's nothing like Katmai. It's a pearl of the planet, and there are no losers. That's why it's a great story. I mean, the fact is that the bears, by gaining weight, are healthy. They'll hibernate, and uh, I already miss them, <laughs> actually. <laughs> well, they're still there, so we can't miss them all yet. I know. But I look at them every so, day. I, I know. Uh, so, Charlie, you're a storyteller. And if you could pick two moments this year that were compelling stories, we've already talked about 909 and 910, which is just an unbelievable story. But do you have two more? Oh, I can talk bear all the time. I have many stories. I mean, <laughs> I, I think that in the beginning of the season, um, seeing 94 with four cubs, I mean, what, what, these mothers are just incredible and i know that one passed away but even three cubs is amazing and watching her was just something i never seen um you know a 747 to me the size of him this year he I, even when he showed up in the beginning of the season i wondered if if he'd gone into hibernation he was <laughs> massive I'm actually really intrigued with 747. He has a very special relationship with Otis. I watch every day, I look at the cams and they seem to have a very deep connection, um, a almost a respect for one another. So I really enjoyed that. And obviously the proliferation of uh, you know, 901 and, and, and some of the, the younger bears, I mean, Bucky Dent, they call him, Shower Bear. He's created a whole new position every day there's magic on the cams. I mean, to say two stories, um, but there were a lot of, like as someone who reviews the photographs every day and loves making clippings, uh, some of the, 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 the naps that would take place on the riverbanks with these ginormous bears passed out. 
I mean, <laughs> you know, it was just, it was just incredible. Um, God, Grazer as always with, uh, and that's why I'm intrigued with Mike's story. I'm intrigued about next season. I'm wondering, maybe they decide to stick together. I love seeing them together. So like, I loved, I just love seeing the the bears happy the underwater sam cam and it was fully going oh, what's there not to like there was one moment where there was a rainbow over cat i don't know if any of the fans saw it incredible i could go on and on i mean i've been watching it every day i, I should say what was the best highlight of the day and of course as you said 909 and, and 910 um and also a lot of the bears in the beginning of the season they showed up kind of beat up Probably a lot of fighting had taken place, like Chunk, 747, Walker. And it's really amazing how by the end of the season, they just kind of like just grew. There were a lot of big bears this year. Yeah, a lot of big bears. And that's the success of the Brooks River. I mean, and it's why we need to protect it and why everyone in this Ecos, this human ecosystem works so hard to protect it. Um, you would explore right. and all the rangers and the maintenance people. And, you know, it just, it, it takes several villages to do that. But boy, is it, it's worth it. You know, like, as I've, I say, and I'll say it again and again, I, my hats go off to the whole team for the selfless work. Is someone who's likes, who's, I like to, sometimes I was doing a podcast and, Sometimes I say explores a, a virtual zoo without bars. And I'm just a tram driver trying to expose beauty. And I'll tell you, and I'll tell you again, there is no other story like Katmai National Park. It's one of the few places where success is happening in the natural world. It's still thriving, but it's not easy. And it's a relentless work behind the scenes. Um, it's such a joy to be able to help the Katmai Conservancy. I wish I could help them more. But I haven't seen anything like it anywhere. And uh, to give you an example, polar bear season will start now. And with it comes the ominous signs of climate change. And are these bears going to triumph? You know, you look at Africa or underwater. But when we see the bears and the salmon spawning and we see Alaska and we see the ecosystem, it's a success story. And it's something the world should follow as a model. And you guys, you don't realize that. I always like to say, if I think of Katmai as a natural cathedral, and that makes you all keepers of this sacred temple. I mean, I, I, that's how I look at you. I have since day one when uh, it was Ranger Roy. Uh, it's it's really remarkable, and it wouldn't be a success story without people like yourself, Naomi. So thank you so much for your work. Oh well, and and thank everyone here because, you know, as you say, it really is this incredible, healthy ecosystem but I don't think we be, can be complacent about it. And that's where all of us come in, the, the Bear Cam viewers and the Conservancy and, um, and uh, you know, uh, it just takes everyone to love it and care for it and not be complacent and, and keep work to keep away threats like Pebble Mine and, um, and be aware when climate change is, is affecting the area. So um, it really is a very special place. And I know that you express that love for Katmai again and again, and I have to thank you. And thank you for joining us in this celebration today. <laughs> you know, like I said, it's my pleasure. Um... I'm humbled to be able to, you know, help hopefully Im improve the ecosystem of Katmai, the rangers, and I'm humbled by the people who watch it every day. I, I'm literally a vessel for all of you. We're one big family and we have a lot to be proud of. And, uh, you know, never stop learning. That's a mantra. And that's what I meant by 909 and 910. That is exploring. Anytime you want to talk bears, you know, I, I could uh, talk bears because I look at the, the hard work every day of the fans who take the photos, which then turn into the video clips. And um, like I said, I will uh, watch until the cameras close. And until then, we'll all meet again. We'll all come out of our hibernation. And meanwhile, there's magic every day happening at Explore. And to anyone, 
welcome to the Explore family. We're, we're grateful to have all of you. And we're all so happy to be here. And Mike, I'm going to call you back in because we want to talk a little bit about some um, great moments over these 10 years of CAMS. Absolutely. And, you know, I mentioned um, you were talking with Charlie about the 909 and 910 relationship. And, you know, if, if had I known like that was going to happen earlier in the year, that would have been like in my top 10 moments of the past 10 years, for sure. I mean, it is that unique. And a lot of, again, a lot of people mentioning that in their comments about their favorite moments this summer. And somebody wrote in my favorite moments were the interactions between 909 and 910 and their cubs. It could be an important research tool on bear families and how they recognize and care for each other. Uh, and, you know, somebody else wrote uh, again about other than the 909 and 910s, it was watching one of the separated cubs uh, from 435 playing with their friends from cubhood. So, for example, 335 had a friendship with 909's yearling and we saw them playing together. So yeah, some really special things happening on the cameras this summer. And we've we've seen so much over the last 10 years. So summer 2022 marked the 10th anniversary of the bear cams in Katmai National Park. And through the bear cams, we've seen bears grow from young cubs into mature adults. We've seen some of those bears become mothers of their own. We've seen bears adapt to life as an old bear, if you want to, you know, use the example of Otis, for example. Um, and we've seen the triumphs, we've seen tragedies, we've seen pretty much everything about a, a bear's life during its active season when it's not in hibernation. So the bear camps provide us with a unique and rare opportunity to learn about and watch individual wild animals. Uh, so, you know, we're going to reflect back on the last 10 years of bear cam and maybe take a closer look at some of the moments that have been meaningful to us. I chronicled several of my memorable moments in videos that you can find on Explored.org's YouTube channel. So there's a playlist there for them. And Naomi, I know you, you have one story in particular it's not in that playlist, but it's very special to you. And I, um, you know, and you've told me about how that moment really demonstrates how the bear cams and watching bears can help people heal. Yeah. So um, I wanted to talk about Bear Eighty Nine Backpack. Um, so in 2014, I was very sick and I couldn't work, and so I was spending a lot of time on the computer. And I saw that bear. I saw. Lord knows how I found the cams. Um, but I saw this big Buddha-like bear in the pose of like a thinker on that rock. And that was it. I was hooked. I could not stop watching Backpack. And, and I've been able to watch Backpack over time, which is one of the incredible things about these cams. And um, there he is this year on his rock. And... Um, Backpack is a 16-year-old bear. He, Holly is his mom. And when he was a yearling, um, he had injured his right foot. And Holly, in her typical Holly maternal style, helped Backpack through that year. I mean, she, she let him go um, ride on her, her back, hence his name, Backpack. Um, and he's grown into this mature um, really beautiful bear, as many of Holly's cubs turn out to be. Um, and um, he's interesting because he's not a very aggressive bear. He doesn't have all the scars that many of um, the big uh, big boars that we see there. Um, but I have to say that um, I was a fangirl. And um, as when I got to Brooks in 2019, um, one of the first things I did was go to the falls and take a picture of Backpack's Rock. So, um, yes, the Backpack truly changed my life. Um, I mean, I never imagined that I would become a park ranger at Katmai at the age of 67. And, um, you know, that, that bear changed my life. Um, did you want to talk about another moment? Um, Mike, another bear? Yeah, there was, you know, one moment that um, I didn't, you know, discuss in the, the series of videos this summer, because um, it ha happened mostly off of the bear cam, but it was one of those moments that was um, very important to the bear cam audience uh, overall. And, you know, in, in national parks, when animals are injured or they're orphaned or they become ill due to non-human causes or reasons, 
then the general policy is to let nature take its course, so to speak. So you can consider it, if you like to watch Star Trek, consider it something like a prime directive of non-interference. Uh, so interpreting that policy and helping people understand the reasons behind it is a, it's a continuous duty for bear cam rangers. It's still a continuous duty for myself through my work on Explode.org and, and the bear cams. However, there are situations when the choice to help an animal in distress is clear. So one of my most memorable bear cam moments was helping the audience to sort of understand and keep track of what was going on with 854 Divot in late July 2014. So Divot uh, returned to Brooks River after a couple week absence. She had a wire snare cinched tightly around her neck. And we don't know specifically where Doc Divot got her necklace, but it was likely outside of the western boundary of the park. And since many of us uh, suspected that the snare would lead to Divot's death, the park hatched a plan to rescue her. I remember the Bear Cam audience clamoring for updates every minute of those days. You know, we often didn't have much information to share, but I know Ranger Roy and I did our best to do so. And the story of her rescue is something that I chronicled in detail in my book. Um, but, you know, long story short, we tracked Divot to a small salmon bearing stream a couple miles from Brooks River. We waited patiently and were able to tranquilize her and remove the snare. Uh, Divot needed a few hours to recover from the tranquilizer. And most all of this situation happened, again, out of sight of the bear cams. Um, Roy and I, we were trying to update the audience as much as we could. I'm still kind of amazed that it worked out the way that it did. Divot, she quickly recovered. Uh, she's continued to thrive as a wild bear. Uh, since then, she's proved to be a successful mom. She had a yearling that year. Uh, and, you know, she's raised a few litters since that time. She's always chubby in late summer. She was chubby again this year. And I think that bodes well for her survival going forward. Divot is definitely a good candidate to return to Brooks River with Cubs next year. Uh, so that's a memorable moment for me that we shared as much as we could with the Bear Cam audience. That scar around her neck that she still carries today is evidence of her ordeal. And it really reminds us that wild animals don't recognize our political boundaries. So we need to make sure that we are, you know, uh, trying to provide good habitat for animals inside of national parks and maybe even more importantly, outside of national parks as well. Naomi, um, I don't know if you were able, you know, you maybe weren't following bear cams during the, um, during the Divot saga, but I know that you were following the bear cams the next year when we witnessed a different story about bears. Um, and especially this is one about hardship and, and loss. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, the bear cams are, um, you know, it's a reality show. It's better than a reality show because there's no producer in the background manipulating the story. And um, the bear cams most of the time make us smile and make us happy and help us get through the day and forget about anything, you know, that we're concerned about in our own lives. But it's not a Disney movie. And we see some really hard times because bear's life is not that easy. I mean, we see them around the Brooks River with plentiful salmon and we see them get fat, but um, it's not always easy. And um, in o October of 2015, there was what I think of as a seminal moment in Bear Cam history. And um, that was when Bear 451 lost one of her cubs in Early October, she um, had three cubs. Two weeks later, only two. And this one, cub that you're seeing now got really sick and stumbled to a place right in front of the Lower River camera. And oh, I'm going to tear up again. Um, so 451 and her healthy cub stayed with that cub. They they only would go away to maybe get some food, get some water. Um, and um, it was a vigil for almost four days. And part of that vigil, vigil were, uh, it, were the bear cam viewers. I mean, I was riveted like everyone else to the cams watching those three bears to see what would happen. And the fact that that 451 and her cubs stuck with that dying cub for so long is something I'll never forget. And I think that moment, I mean, 
if you if you weren't watching the cams, then you should see the story about the four five one cub because it was a bonding experience for those of us who are watching the bear cams and something something we all will never forget and and so that that kind of moment that we get to see and kind of get to share with that that mother bear is so unique and so moving it's something that we need to remember and not forget but along with that really moving and and difficult time to watch on the bear cams um there is a lot of joy and fun and nothing is more joyful and more fun than fat bear week right mike yeah you know it's hard to argue that point um you know every year brings us new stories new bear stories to focus on to you know stories that enrich our understanding of the animals and you know one final highlight for uh you know us every year uh, at the Con Katmai Conservancy at Explored Oregon, of course, I know people watching the bear cans around the world is Fat Bear Week. And the 2022 Fat Bear Week competition was bigger than ever. The virtual tournament to crown the fattest bear at Brooks River got more than a million collective votes. And I was really hoping that we'd break the million vote mark this year. We did that. So thank you for everybody who voted uh, this year. So Fat Bear Week has grown from a, a quirky thing hosted on Katmai National Park's Facebook page to a quirky thing, admittedly, that engages people around the world. Uh, but if you want to learn more about Fat Bear Week, we have a little video about its history. On a chilly September day at Brooks River in 2014, I scrolled through the bear cam comments on explore.org and stumbled upon two photos posted by a viewer. They were images taken from the webcams of the same bear only from different times of the year. The early summer and late summer comparison highlighted the bear's dramatic change in body size. I can't remember who posted the photos or which bear was featured, but I do remember thinking, wouldn't it be fun if people could vote for the fattest bear? Little did I know how popular that idea would become. This is Mike Fitz with explore.org. Here is the history of Fat Bear Week the fattest tournament on earth. Fat is the fuel that allows bears to endure winter hibernation, a prolonged period of starvation when bears do not eat or drink. In the Brooks River area of Katmai National Park, bears gorge on summer's bounty in their attempt to eat a year's worth of food in about six months. Large bears can gain a few hundred pounds in fat before they retire to their winter dens. Originally, Fat Bear Week wasn't a week at all. I brainstormed how a Fat Bear tournament could work with two of my fellow park rangers, Aaron Kameyer and Landis Ehler. We decided to host a one-day event. Fat Bear Tuesday was held on September 30, 2014 with voters choosing Otis as the winner over the elder female bear, 410. At the time, Katmai National Park had perhaps 3,000 followers on social media, but the engagement and reach of the inaugural Fat Bear competition was so great that I decided to expand the event so that more people could participate. The first full-bodied Fat Bear Week took place October 7 through 13, 2015. The beautifully plump bead nose triumphed over defending champ Otis. Since then, Fat Bear Week has ballooned along with the bear's body mass. In 2021, the tournament included a new category, Fat Bear Junior, and Fat Bear Week garnered almost 800,000 votes. The legendary Otis triumphed once again for his unprecedented fourth Fat Bear title. Each year, Fat Bear Week is featured in dozens of magazine, newspaper, and website articles. It even won a Webby Award in 2022. But the true winners are two of Katmai's strongest competitors, the bears and salmon. Fat Bear Week is an opportunity to consider the dramatic annual changes experienced by Katmai National Park's brown bears. Understand 
the importance of fat to their survival, and raise awareness for the National Park and the remarkably healthy Bristol Bay ecosystem, a place that supports the last great salmon run on Earth and more bears than people. Cast your vote for the fattest bear and learn more at fatbearweek.org. Brought to you by Katmai National Park, the Katmai Conservancy, and explore.org. I, I can't stop smiling just watching that. And um, we do have to congratulate this year's winner, 747, the Earl of Avoir du Poix, the Brodignadian beast of a bear. Um, and I want to congratulate him and all his fans. And I also would like to congratulate his um, publicist of many years, Mike Fitz for doing a very good job over the years. Um, I mean, I'm not that great of a seven, name because he's only won twice, you know, so. Well, there's, there's next year. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's not as old as Otis, so there's more time. But um, I, I think that um, when you think about how absolutely big he is, when you see 747 in person, He's just, your jaw drops. He is so, so big. But that size translates through the bear cams as well. Sometimes a camera can distort size, but um, not not this giant. He, he is huge. No wonder he's Stephen Colbert's favorite bear. Um, I, I am so happy that he won this year. It was a well-deserved achievement. And speaking of well-deserved achievements, um, Mike, do you want to talk about this year's winner of the Lifetime Achievement Award? Yeah, last year we awarded the first ever Brooks River Bear Lifetime Achievement Award to 480 Otis for his longevity, his success as an angler, and the ways that people connect with and, and care for bears through him. This year we're going to continue that tradition by recognizing and celebrating the life of another bear. Although we no longer see her at Brooks River, Bear 410 was one of the most consequential bears to have used Brooks River in the last 30 years. At Brooks Camp, rangers don't learn to ID all the bears, but all the rangers knew 410 when I was there. While many uh, bears at Brooks River habituate to the presence of people, it's rare for a bear to become as habituated as 410. She was a remarkably successful bear that challenged people's patience. At the same time, she provided us with amazing wildlife watching opportunities and you know her story revolves around sort of like her ability to habituate to the presence of people and, and habituation is simply getting used to something 410 was the most human habituated bear that i had ever experienced uh, 410 was introduced to the river by her mother in 1989 she encouraged people as a cub or excuse me she encountered people as a cub and a sub adult so uh, her encounters with people reinforced her habituation over time in her 20s, 410 had a well-deserved reputation as a bear who would sleep directly on the trails, next to the lodge in the visitor center, and even under the wildlife viewing platforms. And remember, this was a time before the elevated bridge was built. Sometimes 410's naps caused hours-long delays. Um, and if I saw her fishing in the river, and it looked like she might be coming out of the water, then I would suggest to any visitors near me that they might start moving to their next destination unless they wanted to experience one of the famous 410 bear jams. I remember one year when 410 decided to rest frequently under the platform near the river mouth. And uh, we had you know, a, a bit of a, a glimpse of that there. It was in this, this spot or near this spot uh, she would go to frequently. And in an attempt to dissuade her without disturbing her, I dragged a bunch of brush into a belly hole that she had prepared um, and, and she visited frequently. Uh, so one day after a long fishing session in the river mouth, she got out of the water. She walked to the brush field depression under the platform. She looked at it and she was like, what is this? And then she decided, you know what? Uh, that's not, it's not worth the effort to remove. Uh, so I'll just go uh, somewhere else. So I thought, oh, this is great. It's working, you know, this, <laughs> this subtle persuasion. But she only moved like 10 feet away and then she just laid down right next to the platform again. And we waited, of course. And that was just such a classic 410 move that I sometimes think about. So her choice to rest near the trails and the buildings 
or sometimes a frustration for people. And I'll admit that for sure. But her behavior was not unnatural and she was no less wild than other bears. Forten simply learned to exploit habitat that most other bears didn't. And I'm sure it worked to her advantage. Uh, she was nearly 30 years old the last time that we saw her. Uh, and Naomi, your experience with 410 is um, a little bit different than mine because you didn't have you know, much of an opportunity to see her in person. Uh, so your experience with 410 was you know, primarily through the, through the webcams and her behavior may have represented something different for you than it did for me uh, seeing her in person. Yeah, I mean, I never uh, got to see 410 in person, but on the cams, I mean, you could, I mean, I didn't see that hyper, um, uh, be, you know, her being so used to humans. I mean, you really couldn't tell that from the cams, but we did get to witness some of her epic naps and, um, and just, you know, you just had to laugh. Of course, I wasn't trying to get to the lodge to have lunch. So um, from the cams point of view, you could do that. And I always thought that she was this very um, willful, independent bear who just, she could do what she wanted to do. I mean, she would go um, and be at the, ba at the base of the falls and fish with the big guys. And um, you saw in that picture before that, um, even in her dotage, those big bears were much in love with her. 747 just thought she was the bee's knees. And um, I think she was. And I think she is. She was the queen of the camps as far as I could see. And um, I think she was much deserving of this Lifetime Achievement Award. Mike? Yeah, I miss uh, watching 410. She was a successful and adaptable bear. She was really unique. Um, so she's, uh, yeah, like you said, just so well deserving of a Lifetime Achievement Award. So congratulations to her. And if you have a story about 410 to share, you, know, you can post those in the comments. I'd love to read those after the broadcast today. Um, and in fact, you know, we have, uh, you know, many more comments to share about people's favorite moments this summer. Uh, somebody mentioned watching 747 go up the hill is still an amazing sight. <laughs> it's kind of amazing that he can get up that hill based on, you know, just with his size. Um, somebody else wrote, I've been watching for eight plus years. They witnessed a sad story with 451 and her cub and watched that nonstop. It was heartbreaking, but I love the cams and it, they've helped me through hard times personally. And of course, again, yeah, many comments about 909 and 910. Somebody else said, uh, about grazer actually just following in love with one to eight grazer during my first season watching the bear cams yeah so grazer's a great bear to watch i think she's gonna tell us um or show us many many things about survival in the bear world um going forward so there's much to love about katmai national park and again your donations to the katmai conservancy help us support this amazing place uh it's it's often hard to choose naomi a, a favorite thing about the park and i am you know i'm going to ask you about that in just a moment but that question was posed to some park rangers recently and here's what they had to say my favorite thing about katmai is definitely the wildlife diversity the valley of Ten Thousand smokes everything Katmai is magical. I love the bears and all the rest of the animals and the salmon. It's a perfect place to be for the summer. My favorite thing about Katmai is how crazy everything is. Uh, big volcanoes, big bears, big lakes, the coast. Everything is just like dialed up to 11. My favorite thing about Katmai is the Valley of 10,000 Spokes. I think it's a super cool landscape that you don't see anywhere else on earth. My favorite thing about Katmai is there's something here for everybody. If you like history, if you like geology, if you like science, if you like bears, we have a little bit of something that um, can interest you. Make every national park we've worked at, we felt like we're part of a family, and that family just continues to grow and you make great friendships uh, that last throughout the years. I agree with that 100%. The National Park Service family is amazing. My favorite thing about Katmai is just how much this park has to offer. We all love the bears, but it protects such wonderful salmon and dramatic volcanic landscapes. I've lived here all season and I feel like I've just barely scratched the surface of everything this park has to offer. Um, 
that there's only a couple miles of designated trail and the rest is just untouched nature to be explored. Katmai has everything. It has wildlife, uh, coastal ecology, volcanism. It just has it all. And I feel like, you know, there's so many peaks and creeks and waterfalls that are unnamed. And so it just kind of blows everything away in silent beauty. Beyond Katmai itself, of course, is bears. I love the bears. And plenty of bears here. It's the coolest thing to wake up in the morning and look outside my bedroom window and see a bear running right outside. You know, there's not a lot of places where we could just cohabitate so closely with these wild creatures. Yeah, many things to love about the park. Uh, Naomi, what about you? Can you narrow it down to one or two things or is that impossible? Well, I, everything they said, but I can talk specifically about one thing. And I think my favorite place in the park is Naknek Beach. Um, it's a beach on this huge glacial lake and it has the best sunrises and sunsets anywhere. I mean, seeing the sunrise and sunset with Mount Katolinak in the background and this incredible lake and big bonus you never know what bear you're going to run into on the beach um more than likely you'll see bear 901 um who got really ginormous being a beachcomber for the last few years um i've seen holly take her epic naps um uh on knack neck beach um it really is um a wonderful spot and it's some it's a place that you don't get to see on the bear cams unfortunately but next year um rangers need to make um a video about knack neck beach mike can can you narrow it down to one favorite thing about katmai no no not really um i you know i i'm still thinking about how to answer this question uh, the valley of ten thousand smokes i <laughs> I've spent, you know, maybe about a collective month there exploring that landscape, and it's a unique spot on the face of the earth. There's really nothing quite like it. Um, so I've had some of the most amazing sort of like, um, you know, solo experiences or or alone time experiences um, ever in that in that landscape. And I, I'm a person who likes to be alone. So to get out there, where you can be in a in a spot like near Nova Rupta when the wind is calm and it's so quiet that. It, it feels like if you're opening the zipper on like your tent, if that feels like an intrusion on the landscape, it is, it is just that quiet. So those are like amazing places, the wildlife, of course, the bears, the salmon, um, you know, I can't really imagine what my life would be like right now without, you know, having discovered, you know, the bears and the salmon. And then also the opportunity to discover, I mean, Katmai's, um, you know, an, an area um, where there's a lot that we still have to learn about uh, as far as like, you know, uh, different plant species and insects. I mean, hardly anybody's done, you know, work on insects in, in the park or in that area. So if anybody's, you know, looking to discover, I mean, there's, there's opportunities there and we get to do that, you know, not a, with the smallest creatures there. Um, and of course, even with the biggest animals in the park with the brown bears and, and watching their behavior and discovering more things about their amazing lives. So yeah, I, I can't narrow it down um, to just one thing. Now, we're coming up on the end of our broadcast here in just a few moments. And before we do so, of course, I want to thank the backstage crew at explore.org for making everything work. And of course, um, you know, everybody at the, um, at the Katmai Conservancy as well, who works so hard uh, to support the park, my um, fellow board members and the staff, of course, of the Conservancy, Guy Runko and, and Michael Bay. Um, you know, we also have the Bear Camp moderators who do a wonderful job of distributing information in the chats. Uh, for Explored work. And then we have that army of volunteer camera operators who work so hard to provide everybody with, um, you know, those amazing wildlife watching opportunities. Uh, before we conclude though, uh, Naomi, I know that you wanted to talk about the healing power of nature and how webcams, you know, play a role in that. And I wanted to say one more big thank you to all the National Park Service employees at um, Katmai National Park. Um, it's a magical place to be, but it's a lot of hard work. And um, the rangers and the maintenance people, they, they put in that hard work. And so I'm, I wanna thank them as well. But I did wanna say something about the healing powers of nature. Um, I've talked about how it's helped me 
Um, and I know many of you bear cam watchers have similar stories. Um, Oliver Sacks was a neurologist, um, a famous author. Uh, he wrote the book Awakenings, which became a movie as well. And he also wrote a lot about the healing powers of nature. And I want to read a quote from him, and I think you will all understand. I cannot say exactly how nature exerts its calming and organizing effects on our brains, but I've seen in my patients the restorative and healing powers of nature and gardens, even for those who are deeply disabled neurologically. In many cases, gardens and nature are more powerful than any medication. I think that describes the impact of Katmai and the bears and the bear cams. And I, I know many of you feel that way and I hope it inspires you to find healing in the nature around you, whether it's your garden in the back or, or trails near where you live because I know you're always going to come back to the bear camps and always come back to Camp Mai. So um, I just want to thank um, Mike and Explore for inviting me to this celebration and, um, and hope that people are still contributing to the Otis Fund because um, those coffers are still open and the park needs your help. Um, Mike, you have some concluding words for us? Places like Katmai, Katmai they they can't exist without the support of, of people. So we'll hope you'll join our efforts to protect Katmai and wild spaces and wildlife everywhere. You know, it's important for the bears and the salmon of, of Katmai, of course, but it's important for the animals that you share your spaces with, wherever that happens to be. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to do right now is to make um, the landscape that I'm a steward of right behind me here, I have legal title over this, but I don't necessarily consider it mine. I'm just a caretaker of this land right behind me. So making that more wildlife friendly, um, you know, through a, a variety of different things, but we can do that no matter where we happen to be. Even in the densest cities, you're surrounded by some pretty amazing animals that are surviving in some pretty amazing ways. Uh, so, you know, we can work towards, I think, that shared goal. And look to, um, you know, Katmai as a beacon of hope. Um, you know, the world really is wounded by climate change and mass extinction. So there's a lot to be concerned about, but there's also a lot to save everywhere. And we can save that for everyone if we make that effort. So, um, you know, vote for people who will work to tackle the climate crisis. Be sure to support sustainable fisheries like that in Bristol Bay. And be sure to raise awareness for brown bears and salmon in wild places. Uh, because that's talking about these, these places is one of the most impactful things that you can do. And of course, if you can donate, please do so to the matching fundraiser, which ends at midnight tonight. Explore.org will match those donations again up to $200,000. Uh, and those donations will be used to help fund staffing and equipment and research needs at Katmai National Park. Uh, my name is Mike Fitz. Uh, Naomi, thanks so much for taking the time out of your day to join us. It's been a really fun chat and uh, great to see you back on Bear Camp again. Great to be here. And until we talk again, everybody, have a great day and enjoy those bears.